session, we're going to cover e-visits and phone visits for patients. So most of us had, have never heard the term e-visits until the COVID-19 crisis occurred. And so wanted to make sure that you had an understanding of the difference in telehealth and e-visits and what does an e-visit entail. So why e-visits? Um, in a regulatory waiver that was issued by CMS in about mid-March, Medicare is now allowing therapists to perform e-visits for established patients. And so in this session, we're going to explore what's an e-visit, what does it mean, um, and how does, how does those work? So an e-visit is a non-face-to-face patient-initiated digital communication that requires a clinical decision that otherwise typically would have been provided in the office. So e-visits traditionally, historically, have been provided by physicians and not by therapy providers. Um, this is the outpatient therapy world um, that we're talking about. And so as a part of this waiver that came along um, in mid-March, uh, we have been put into a category of professionals that can provide an e-visit and be paid for an e-visit. Um, the codes are intended to cover short-term, up to seven-day assessment and management activities that are conducted online or via a digital platform. And it's really not a visit, um, even though the word says visit, it's really activities and correspondence that help to support a patient. So we're gonna get into the details of what an e-visit is and how you would bill that correctly if you are working in outpatient therapy with Medicare patients. So e-visits are not telehealth, e-visits are not tele-rehab, and e-visits are not a true substitute for therapy. So in our last session, we talked about telehealth, what telehealth entailed, all of that um, information about what a telehealth visit would look like, and an e-visit is not a telehealth visit. And as we discussed in our last session, as of today, Medicare is not covering true telehealth for outpatient therapy visits. So as it stands today, and today is April the 6th, um, Medicare is not covering telehealth services, but they are covering e-visits for Medicare outpatients. E-visits are a pathway to keep in touch with your patient, a pathway for your patients to get their questions answered, and it's certainly better than no uh, ability to interact with our patients. So we wanna make sure that we delineate the difference between a telehealth visit and an e-visit. So let's look at all the pieces and parts for an e-visit. In order to perform an e-visit, you have to do an e-visit with an established patient. So this is a patient that you've already evaluated, that you've developed a plan of care for, a patient that you're familiar with, you've been working with, okay? It, by definition, is not a face-to-face -face interaction. So it's not audio, visual, uh, internet communications like we talked about in the telehealth webinar. Another kicker is that it needs to be patient initiated. So the patient has to request the e-visit. By definition, it is using some sort of digital communication. We'll talk a little bit more in detail what that means. An e-visit requires clinical decision-making. So you cannot bill an e-visit if your interaction with the patient did not require clinical decision-making. And then in that other part of the definition says, that otherwise typically would have been provided in the office. So folks ask me, well, is this billable during the e-visit? Does this activity um, mean I could bill it during that e-visit? And my answer would be that if it would be billable in the clinic, then it's billable in the e-visit. For example, patient education or explaining to them how to do an exercise or discussing with them some challenges they're having 
uh, with their pain or sleeping examples, for example. So um, remember the definition says established patient, non-face-to-face, patient initiated, use of digital communication requires a clinical decision-making and for activities that otherwise would typically have been provided in the office. Um, and then at the end of that definition, it says conducted online or via some other digital platform. So we'll talk about what does that mean. So by definition, an e-visit occurs uh, by the patient interacting with you through an online patient portal. And by definition, a patient portal is a secure online website that gives patients a convenient 24-hour access to protected health in information from anywhere with an internet connection, uh, requires a secure username and password. So for those of you who may work in hospital systems that use Epic, for example, um, Epic has a patient-facing um, portal called MyChart. And so if you are a patient and you use my chart, you can go into my chart, ask your provider a question, they can answer you. And if it met that criteria that we've outlined, that could be an e-visit. Now, many of you that work in an outpatient environment um, may not have an online patient portal as defined uh, by that previous slide. Uh, CMS has implied that they're going to give providers flexibility in the platform that's being used. So um, if you have adopted a telehealth platform, then that might be your best option, even though you need to understand and realize that an e-visit is not telehealth. So I would call my Medicare administrative contractor to make sure that what I'm doing qualifies as an e-visit. But right now with the waivers that are in place, um, they're being a little less stringent about the rules uh, that they're applying so that patients can get the services that they need. So who can perform an e-visit? Well, if you look at the definition of the code, so if you back up a couple of slides, you will see that the word assessment is used in the code. And so, because the word assessment is used in the code, Medicare says those services have to be performed by a clinician. And if you remember back to Medicare rules and regs, a clinician is defined as a PT and OT, a speech language pathologist, but not an assistant. So if you're going to perform and bill e-visits, those should be done uh, by the therapist and not by the assistant. So what codes are we gonna bill for these e-visits? So Medicare has, has three different G codes that they are allowing um, us to use to bill for e-visits. And these came out in this March 17th publication that we're discussing. So G2061 states qualified non-physician healthcare professional, online assessment and management for a pa established patient for up to seven days, cumulative time during the seven days, five to 10 minutes. Then you see G2062, same definition, but it's 11 to 20 minutes. And then G2063 is 21 or more minutes over a period of seven days, cumulative seven days. So if you had a uh, interaction with your patient you are answering the questions about their home exercise program, they were confused, and you spent um, 20 minutes doing that, then you would bill G2062. Now, let's say that a patient uh, interacts with you on Monday, they ask questions, you answer them, you, you solve their problems, and that took you 15 minutes on Monday. And then um, they interact with you again on Thursday of the same week, and you spend another 10 minutes with the patient interacting and answering their questions. Um, over that seven day period of time, you have 15 minutes on Monday, 10 minutes on Thursday, you have a 25 minute time frame. So then you would build G2063 because you spent 21 or more minutes with the patient in that seven day time frame, So I know this is a 
confusing kind of coding because it's not what we typically do. Um, so my uh, suggestion would be that you don't build these codes until the end of the week unless in your first interaction you've already done more than 21 minutes and that's going to be your max code that you could build for that seven day period of time then you could go ahead and build that code all right so i think this graph is helpful because uh, there's continues to be um, a misunderstanding that currently Medicare is covering telehealth visits for outpatient therapy, and that is not true. Um, now, like I said, I don't normally date these presentations, but the date is important here because today is April the 6th. As of today, that is true, um, but there's a huge advocacy effort um, ongoing to try to get Medicare to put physical occupational therapist and speech language pathologist on the list of approved providers who can provide telehealth. So as it stands today, uh, the answer is no. Uh, that answer could change at, at any point in time. So, you know, keep checking, check with the APTA website. I gave you a ton of references on the last webinar, um, but just keep looking because things are changing um, frequently. So, as it stands today, Medicare telehealth visits not covered for therapy. And you can see what those codes would entail. Virtual check-ins, which are covered for physicians, are also not covered for therapy. What is covered for PT right now are these e-visits. And because we are not physicians, we are going to use the 2061, 62, and 6 three codes. So the 99 codes are specific for physicians and we've been instructed to use the G codes for e-visits. So let's look a little bit more into the limitations of these. As we discussed with the codes, the cumulative time needs to be added up in a seven-day period and the max amount of time that you can spend uh, doing e-visits and be paid for it is 21 minutes or more. So even if you spent 40 minutes with a patient during a seven day period of time, answering their questions, interacting with them, your max that you're gonna be able to bill is at that G2063 code. Um, so the highest paying code is at 21, it says 21 plus, um, but, and just to give you kind of an idea of what these pay, on average around the country, remember there's geographic differences in what we get paid for codes, but this uh, G2063 code, which is the highest code, is paying about $35 um, nationwide, 33 to 35, somewhere in that range. So it's not a high paying code. Um, so the clock starts when the patient initiates the e-visit and then the clock ends after a seven day period of time. You can only bill one of those G codes per seven day period and you cannot have a face-to-face -face visit with the patient seven days before the e-visit and seven days after the e-visit. So that's an important piece to this puzzle. So let's say you saw the patient last week in the office, um, then you would have to count seven days after the visit before you can perform an e-visit and be paid for it. So, and then you would not be able to see the patient in the office and bill for a regular, you know, regular CPT codes um, until the seven days have elapsed after the e-visit. So, you know, if your clinic has shut down or if your clinic, you know, you have your Medicare patients that are in high risk areas, they're not coming for their outpatient visits, they're Medicare patients, um, and you know they're not gonna be in the clinic for several weeks, uh, then you could do an e-visit with the patient to answer their questions, uh, but just realize there are some limitations. Um, one of the most um, confusing things, and we don't really have a good answer for you, is can you build more than one of these e-visits in an episode of care? So let's say my patient's gonna not get therapy for the next three weeks, 
can I bill, bill an e-visit for each of those seven day periods, so three times in that uh, three week period of time. And um, CMS has not clarified that for us uh, as a whole. So the best answer I can give you is to call, specifically call your Medicare administrative contractor and ask them that question. I did have one therapist tell me uh, that she called Neridian, um, which is the Medicare administrative contractor for California. And um, that they were told that yes, they can indeed bill an e-visit for every seven day period of time. But again, we don't have that in writing. So I would call and ask the question. Um, the other kind of important piece of this is the patient must initiate the e-visit. So you can tell the patient that you now have this e-visit option uh, and you can give them a mechanism for initiating the e-visit. Um, but they need to initiate the e-visit. So um, if you do an e-visit on Tuesday at 8 o'clock every Tuesday, that would probably be suspicious. Um, so let your patients know what your mechanism is, how to initiate the e-visit, and then you can perform that um, during that seven-day period of time. Remember, these are not true telehealth visits. And so if you do those for a Medicare outpatient, um, currently, as it stands today, that is a non-covered service. And so in order to get paid for that telehealth visit, a true telehealth visit, um, you would have to do that as a cash-based visit. The other questions that people ask is like, well, does an e-visit have to be in my plan of care? I certainly didn't plan. Uh, to have a COVID crisis and we plan for our patients to be in the clinic, but now things have changed. And so an e-visit does not have to be in your plan of care. Um, does an e-visit count towards your 10th visit progress note requirement? And the answer is no, because remember, it's not technically a visit. So it is not a part of your progress note count. Um, how do you document an e-visit? So um, each of the different EMRs are handling this a little bit differently, but I would document it in a regular note um, or an administrative note, depending on how my EMR is handling that. Document why it's an e-visit versus a regular visit. Document that the patient initiated the e-visit and consented to the e-visit and why they initiated the visit. Then you note what was done, make sure that you show clinical decision-making uh, and build the correct code based on the amount of time you spent um, with that you know, issue that you're addressing. Um, we know that therapists in private practice can build these G-codes, um, but right now there's some um, unknown about whether a facility like a hospital outpatient department can build these e-visits. So again, some unanswered questions about e-visits at this point in time, but again, I would uh, call my Medicare administrative contractor if I was in a hospital outpatient department and ask the question. Some other billing things that you might be aware of. Um, so remember, if you perform in office visits, the place of service code is 11. If you do in-home visits, place of service code is 12. And if you do true telehealth, the place of service code is 02. Um, Medicare has directed us to build the place of service code 11 for these. And you will bill, if it's a PT providing the service, you bill with a GP modifier. And then you bill with a CR modifier. And that CR modifier, um, references that we were do we are doing e-visits under a waiver because of this emergency period of time that we are currently in. Um, if you are a facility provider and you bill these codes, and again, there's some questions as to if that will work or not, um, you are going to bill with a DR modifier as a condition code and a CR modifier on, on the CPT code. Um, Medicare coinsurances and deductibles apply to these. So if the patient you know, has traditional Medicare, 
Medicare pays 80% on outpatient um, therapy or outpatient services. And if the patient were not to have a supplemental insurance, then the patient would be paying 20% of the Medicare allowable for the G code that you build. Um, we do not know how secondary insurances are gonna process these. So just be aware there's still a good number of un unanswered questions until we get the chance to bill some of these and get paid for them. Um, I'm not sure we, we will know the answers, maybe not even then. Um, some other codes that I wanna discuss with you are some other codes that are also found in the same section that these G codes are found in. And we've been giving, some of our commercial payers are giving us instructions to build these other codes. And so not truly allowing telehealth, but allowing some of these um, e-visits or phone assessments. So I wanna discuss those so you'll be aware of them if in your region a payer instructs you to use those. So just to be aware, if you see codes 99, 421, 422, and 423, these are evaluation and management codes for physicians, specifically for physicians. So you should not be billing any 99 codes um, for therapy, unless an insurance is just really going out there and doing something crazy. So just be asking lots of questions if someone is directing you to build these 99 codes. What we do have is some 98 codes and not 98 codes are non-physician telephone services. And so that is assessment and management services provided by telephone by qualified healthcare professional, <coughs> excuse me, initiated by established patient or his or her guardian. So it does exclude that the qualified health care provider initiate the call. So that means the patient, again, has to initiate. Um, it would exclude if you had seen the patient within the last 24 hours or, or seven days prior or 24 hours after. So if you've seen the patient in the last seven days, um, you cannot build these telephone visits. And if you see the patient within 24 hours of their phone call, you also cannot bill these codes. So they're a little different than the G codes that we discussed earlier. Um, so 98966, 98967, and 98968. And the description of these codes are telephone assessment and management services provided by a qualified healthcare professional, non-physician, to an established patient, parent, or guardian not originating from a related assessment and management service provided within the previous seven days, nor leading to an assessment management service or procedure within the next 24 hours or soonest available appointment. And then similar to those G codes, you see uh, 98966 is five to 10 minutes, 67 is 11 to 20 minutes, and 68 is 23 to 30 minutes. So the time frames are a little bit different and these codes then with the G codes. So if a, a commercial payer um, and, you know, tells you to use these codes and uh, that they're not covering true telehealth, then the, you will have this definition. Um, so this was just a Blue Cross example in one of the states. Uh, Blue Cross was not allowing for true telehealth, but they did uh, direct physical occupational speech therapist to use these uh, codes for telephone visits. Um, so again, if they're directing you to use these codes, then you would follow the code definition that was on the previous slide. Um, there is one other set of uh, 9-8 codes. So 98970, 98971, and 98972 are qualified non-physician healthcare professional online digital evaluation and management service for an established patient for up to seven days, cumulative time during the seven days, five to 10 minutes, 11 to 20 and 21. So these are the exact same definitions as the G codes that Medicare has put forth. Um, why Medicare decided to use the G codes instead of these, I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, but you might be directed by a commercial payer 
uh, to use these codes for an online digital evaluation and management service. So again, these are not true telehealth visits. These are the same e-visits as we've been directed to do by Medicare, um, but just specific to a commercial payer. I do want to bring up a little bit about the CARES Act. So the CARES Act was passed uh, just a little over a week ago, and it has opened some additional doors to us that I want to make you aware of. And um, so things are, again, constantly changing uh, because of legislation that's being put forth and passed um, during this emergency period of time. So the CARES Act was passed on March the 27th. It lifts the 2% sequestration reduction in Medicare payments um, from, for May 1st to December 31st. So uh, if you remember back, way back when you studied coding billing, um, we are paid based on the Medicare fee schedule, but we have had a 2% reduction of that for several years. Uh, because of the Congress put this in place to try to help balance the budget. So as part of the CARES Act that was passed as part of this emergency package of legislation, uh, that 2% sequestration will not be in place at least through the end of the year. Um, the CARES Act also opens the door for Medicare expansion of telehealth um, it still requires the Health and Human Services Secretary to waive restrictions specifically for therapists. So, but it gives the, the Division of Health and Human Services the power and authority to put into place additional waivers to help patients get the services that they need and keep them safe. So, keep checking because we are certainly hopeful that CMS will put forth an additional waiver, add in therapists to the list of approved providers to perform telehealth. And um, so we'll see if that happens or not. Uh, I put this in here because it just might be important to you. Uh, the CARES Act also deferred student loan payments through September 30th and expands unemployment benefits. So if any of you are, have been laid off or furloughed, um, those might be important pieces of information for you. All right, some additional references for you. Um, this is a great uh, article that answers a lot of questions about e-visits. This is a Medicare reference on e-visits and a Medicare Learn article on e-visits. So hopefully that gives you now an understanding of the difference between an e-visit and a telehealth. So just to recap, telehealth, face-to-face, -face, audio, visual, real-time interaction, having the patient actually go through their activities, exercises, um, evaluating the patient, seeing how they're doing, progressing them, addressing their issues, making progress, adding to their home exercise program, adding to their uh, activities that they're working on, true telehealth. Um, E-visit, patient initiated, using some sort of digital communication, not necessarily a face-to-face -face, uh, real-time interaction because that is not the definition of the code. Patient calls you, for example, and says, I'm having trouble with this, I'm having increased pain, I'm having a problem, and you address that specific issue, you decide how much time it took, and then you would build the appropriate G code for Medicare. For telehealth, true telehealth, uh, you're billing regular CPT codes. So I hope that that distinction helps you to understand the difference and I hope this information was helpful. Have a great day.